let's get started. Um, today, I'm joined by Kendall Stewart, um, who's had a, a decorated swimming career, who I've got to know over the last, what has it been, over a year now, um, and kind of have, have had a front row seat as she's navigated out of a very successful career in swimming and seamlessly into a career in sales. So excited uh, that you're here. Um, welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Excited to to chat and kind of make it a little official. We always have great chats, so eager to get into it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we've had similar conversations that we've had on on other episodes around your mindset and and how similar um, what it takes to be successful in in athletics as it does in sales and trying to find a good fit for you when you were transitioning out into a career that really aligned to the athletic mindset that you've had that made you successful. So um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. And yeah, I'm excited to, to jump into the conversation. Um, why don't we start just from the beginning, take me back to getting started. Where'd you grow up? Tell everyone kind of how swimming came into your life. Yeah, absolutely. So I am from Carlsbad, California, so north of San Diego, kind of in between San Diego and Orange County, and started lessons just to become safe in the ocean, right? Like spent a lot of time at the beach, and I think my parents are primarily concerned with just like you have to learn how to swim. And for me, it was pretty social. My my best friends were in that little pod that we did swim lessons with and, and joined the swim team with, and I just loved it. I was doing lots of things. I was doing dance and gymnastics and swimming but like swimming very quickly became the thing that I loved and I think there was no coincidence that it was the thing I was really good at I was excelling really quickly and um I'd say like from seven I from when I was on that swim team a couple times a week I was like by 10 years old swimming in junior olympics like full-time I want to be an olympic swimmer like from very young I think um so it happened that quickly for you so you you get put into swim lessons so you're safe and that you can go into the ocean growing up in a beach town and how does that how quickly or what was the process between starting to swim competitively and then getting into like I want to be a swimmer yeah so I think if I have my timeline right I started on the club it was called North Coast Aquatics I was I started on that little summer league swim team when I was seven and I think by the time I was 10, I was at Junior Olympics, which is young to be competing at like a little meet like that. But that's kind of where you get your feet wet with year round feet wet. So it was a year round competition. Um, and I remember being, you could progress from red group to white group to blue group and then to age group and kind of the hierarchy of this age group system. I remember being really young, but outperforming the girls in that even that 10 and under group and my coach thinking to me, like even though your friends are here and you're here for the social element you can't be like in blue group and also swimming in jo's like we need to move you up quickly and i'm complaining like i don't want to because my friends are here um which is funny because i think that my longevity in swimming i can like really attribute to the social element and just the fun and experience related things but i think um from maybe 10 years old was young for me to say, Hey, I want to be a swimmer. But by the time I was 13, I was swimming at Olympic trials. And I think I was a handful of maybe less than five women who were that young, who were at Olympic trials in 2008. And at that point I thought, okay, like this is the biggest, the biggest swim meet in the country. And oftentimes people call it a more competitive swim meet than the actual Olympic games because the United States swim team is so deep. Um, and I was, I was 13 at that point and just thought, okay, like clearly we have something here. <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't, I mean, I think there are a lot of people as I've spoken to more athletes and have like dipped my toe into like the Olympic world and learning about the different sports, whether it be swimming, whether it be running, whether it be gymnastics, some of these sports that are so prevalent, it feels like you know, for unfortunately every four years, and then they kind of like go away a little bit. I feel like they're not as front and center and people don't know exactly how the Olympians become Olympians. And to hear, I know gymnastics gets start, started really early and, you know, you see Olympians that are super young in, the, in gymnastics. I didn't realize that it was that young in swimming. Is that like taking it seriously at 10 is one thing, but being at Olympic trials at 13, that's like, is that uncommon? 
It is a little uncommon. I think I, women definitely peak or have earlier success than men do in swimming if we're speaking generally. Um, so I, by the time the 2020 Olympics came around, I was get, getting ready for my fourth Olympic trials, 2008, 2012, 2016, 2020. And I think that I would have been the only, I've had the long swimming career, especially never having, having actually swam in the Olympics or winning an Olympic medal, like maybe Lochte or Grievers might've been like truly the only one, other ones um, who are if you're unfamiliar swimming, just like Olympic gold medalists, um, they may have been the only other ones there that had like been through that many trials. I think my career was especially long, um, but I do think it's, it's such a time commitment, like truly swimming is so many hours. And I think every sport is, but it's just in high school, I swam every day, twice a day, like getting up at before 4am to make it to the pool before high school, like it's almost 30 hours a week in high school, which just feels like it's reps. You have to get them in. It seems like it is um, a commitment early on in your life too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be that successful, that young, I know you were setting um, like world records or was it U S records at a, as like a young teenager, were those records that were like a competing against adults? Because there's got to be a physical strength element, obviously a lot of technique and that goes into any sport, but isn't there like a physical strength element to swimming that at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, you just, it's impossible to compete with someone who's 18, 19, 21, 22 years old? Yeah. So it's, swimming's kind of interesting because depending on whether you're a power athlete or an endurance athlete, there's like so many different ways that swimmers train. Um, but I, I did, I think the records that you're speaking about, I had all these national records kind of in age groups. So I was the fastest 13, 1400 butterflyer and the fastest 15 or whatever the age group was. So for that age range, I was consistently like performing, outperforming or like pacing well to develop well, right? It's kind of how they set incentives for people coming up in USA swimming. Um, and so I was really good, really young. And then I think, yeah, I, I had success definitely in college, but I think that like this pace and this like almost whirlwind that you get sucked into with athletic success that just feels like unstoppable for a little while that came really early um for me I think a little bit a little bit um earlier than most I think it also contributed to this sort of like interesting thing that I have now and sort of refining out who I am outside of swimming as I transition to the workforce because I don't think I had a balanced social life or a balanced extracurricular life in middle school and high school and I picked my college based on where I wanted to swim and my coach and my swim team and thankfully I had great academic options to pick schools from I had great opportunities and great scholarships and I had options that gave me great degrees but I think that um kind of growing up in this funnel of like, I'm really good at swimming. I'm obsessed with swimming. This is going to be my thing. Didn't prepare me well to be like, okay. It's, it felt like it kind of snuck on me with, okay, snuck up on me. Like, okay, it's done. And what else do I like to do? I don't know, because I've been doing this since I was seven and this has been my life's thing since I was so young. Um, and maybe that was unusual when I was growing up to have, to be so young and so committed and truly really have it driven and it be like from myself. But then kind of, as you go up, through college and through you and when you enter professional sport it's like okay now these people have kind of caught up to me everyone everyone else here is really good and this is what my peers are doing and it's the social movement and it's like um less I had the environment around me at that point um and so I think I'm realizing now that I hadn't like I don't know put myself out there or challenged myself and really thought too much about who I am outside of middle school so I'm 28 now <laughs> Well, you know, in a sense, you didn't have a choice. And that's the crazy yeah. part, right? Like you're you get thrown into swimming at as a almost a safety measure or just something to put young people in, right? So they can learn how to swim. And then everyone's like, Well, I'm really good at this. And you kind of got selected as this is going to be your thing. Like, sure, you you loved it, but I don't know. You think back to like every every athlete started out in a very innocent place. Like you said, you just wanted to be with your friends and it got real. It seems like it got really serious for you really quickly. And you, you do kind of just wrap your identity up in it from a young age. 
I, I don't know if there's any way to be super successful without that. I don't know if there's like, hey, did it happen too soon? Do you wish that it happened? Um, it didn't happen the way it happened because as, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective because as it's happening, one, you don't realize it's happening, but two, it's kind of, you're into it, right? You love it and it's your thing and you kind of just get obsessed with it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, totally. And I don't, I don't wish that it kind of unfolds any different way. I kind of, I felt like by the time I got to college and I had this, like, just more well I just had more opportunity right I kind of was we had a quiet house my family was just me and my mom my dad my brother we kind of are all like introverted kind of quiet people my best friends in school were ones that I had known my whole life I was this really dedicated athlete and not super social in high school and I came to college and I had all these friends who are on the same page as me everyone wants to swim out everyone wants to get really great not to say that my club swimming friends weren't that for me but it's just everyone's living together you've got you know parties extracurriculars just like every, you're living in a new city I just felt like my world opened up a little more and at that point even though I was in this elevated NC2A division one swimming program with a with a coach who is the head coach of an Olympic team I just felt like I loosened up a little bit and swimming became more of a part of Kendall rather than my whole identity. And I think that timeline doesn't match up with a lot of girls that I was on the national team with. I think that that obsession with swimming and that like kind of insular world almost with these girls who had this success or this like new peaking or interest or whatever you want to call it, blossoming and swimming that came in college or even maybe at the end of college into their professional career, I kind of um felt like I had that early on and I think that timing is a real thing and maybe um towards the later end of my career I was in it for opportunity and relationship and travel and that sort of thing and I was missing that like obsession that I had in middle school when I was missing out on dances and school field trips and that kind of thing maybe if that was timed differently then my success or my trajectory would have been different but I don't um I don't have any regrets or wish that it played out any differently. I think that it's all like a part of who I am and my story, you know? Yeah, of course. So it sounds like, I don't want to say peaked early, but the, the peaking of your mental like obsession may have happened early and that didn't necessarily coincide with the ideal timing to win a gold medal in the Olympics. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think so, yeah. I think that I, I swam well in college. I switched up my training environment and I had some great best times. I had a lot of momentum going into the 2016 Olympics. Um, I was an alternate to the team in 2016. So they take the top one and two in my best event. I was third place at the trials. And so I felt like a lot of people say that's the most heartbreaking thing that could happen to you in swimming, right? You'd rather be eighth place or ninth place, not make the top eight final at Olympic trials than come third, right? It's like just horrible and I didn't feel that way I was like god I that's pretty good like being the third best in the country in this really competitive race and um being so close to having my dream come true and I didn't feel like it just ripped my heart out like I was watching other people react people were just like could not rebound from that and I was kind of like I'm still gonna keep swimming I still love it I'm traveling I'm really fit I'm spending time with my friends outside like what is what am I missing here why is this so sad um and that's the kind of thing that makes me feel like Hmm, I wonder if my like life wasn't as invested into it as some of these other people. And maybe that's like the missing percent or like when you're at that level, maybe I needed that to kind of push me over the edge. But also I think that that's been a strength of mine in my transition from sport too, is like having kind of some perspective. Yeah. I think that, listen, to be like, have a singular focus to achieve greatness is a great thing and like i said sometimes a necessary thing um but there is something to be said and something to be proud of of just naturally maturing as a human being and to realize that there's more to life perhaps than that um and being okay with not necessarily like getting exactly what you wanted and and still finding like value and and being a little bit more well-rounded it's it's a hard thing to do. And I don't think a lot of people in your shoes would have been able to do that. So I think you deserve a lot of credit for it because for some people, like you said, it could have, it could have crushed them and they could have gone in a completely different direction. 
Yeah, thank you. I think kind of on a similar note, I think it did take me a while to, I, I probably could have moved on from swimming after 2016. Um, I felt like I still had more that I wanted to give to swimming and ultimately I didn't swim that much faster in my last five years or four years or whatever it ended up being after that um, 2016 Olympics. But I'm losing my train of thought now. Oh, I decided to kind of step away from swimming and not compete in the Olympic trials that ended up being postponed during COVID because I felt like it just wasn't important to me anymore. Similarly, like, I'm not even sure if these games are going to happen. At this point, it's been half of my life training for these Olympics that now are this big, vague thing. There's going to be no spectators. Like, my mind's eye, the vision that I've had since I was 10 years old or whatever, it's just not going to be reality whether I'm there or not and I'm not having fun I'm stripped of these these things that I mentioned I like my friends the travel all of the like being outside and having fun that is all removed in COVID and that external pressure and that Olympic cycle mindset it just became like not it it was just not the swimming that I had enjoyed my whole life and I actually it was really hard to come to that realization like I was so upset to to realize like swimming is actually not the most important thing in my life. And I think I actually don't care about the Olympics anymore. That was, that was pretty earth shattering for me, but I was so thankful to have opted out on my own um, and kind of made that decision for myself. Cause there was a lot of swimmers that competed in that meet who maybe expected to make the team or really had their heart and their whole life on the line for it and were blindsided by the results of that meet didn't make the Olympics in 2020 it was kind of this weird year right everything in COVID was weird but it was particularly strange the way that the Olympic team selection shook out and I think a lot of people struggled with the chaoticness of who was selected to that team and who wasn't I was really thankful that I like knew myself well enough to kind of remove myself from it realized it wasn't up to me I'd rather make this decision for myself than kind of go through the motions and see how it pans out um and so that's something that I was proud of even though it was like ultimately ultimately I didn't do the thing I wanted to do my whole life but I was proud of the way that I kind of came to that decision yeah and I definitely want to talk more about that around your mindset of like getting to that place of peace and and being at a place where you can walk away. And there's there's a lot that I want to cover with you there. But just to take a step back, like when you were competing and you were training, like maybe even like in college or as you entered college, like it takes a certain it takes an insane amount of dedication and drive. Like I'm curious, like where where that came from early on and is that something that you ever needed to be pushed towards was that kind of just the way you were built like where did that mindset come from yeah i i honestly people ask me did your parents swim were your parents competitive swimmers no neither one of them swam at all um weren't really even like collegiate athletes i mean they're active people but um no it was truly always my thing I remember like I used to wake up I lived 30 miles away from the pool that I swam at in high school before school and after school so I used to we used to pull the tarps off of the, the pool covers off of the pool at 4 45 in the morning we were in the water at five in high school and I used to wake up have a whole sit down breakfast and drive 30 minutes to the pool so I'd wake up at 3 45 wow. in high school and I would wake my mom up and I would be the one I would set the alarm I'd go in there and I'd wake her up like mama mom get up drive me to practice if I ever was like really overwhelmed with school there it was never like a you have to go to practice it was like you should take practice off and make sure that you have your priorities in, in order or take some rest. I was always like, if there was any hesitation and you don't know if you want to do this, um, just err on the side of opt out of it and like allow yourself that decision. So I'm really thankful for my parents sort of um, neutrality. Like, and I think that any pressure that I had came from, I had coaches with high expectations always. Um, and I think that's, that's good. I mean, for a young person, structure and striving, and especially if my parents were really neutral, I think that's helpful. But um, I think outside of like some tough coaches, I think it was always kind of my thing. I was, I really just, I cared so much. I wanted to be at the pool in the morning. Yeah. And was it um 
like when that alarm goes off at 345, there's definitely days where it's like, all right, that's early. Like it, it's probably like there are days where maybe yes more than no or, or no more than yes is kind of like in your mind. But like, did you have like, what was your vision? Like, was it like very, like, I've talked to a lot of athletes and like their, the vision that drove them in those moments, whether it's waking up or you're in the pool and like struggling on a last like lap or whatever it may be, like, were there things that were very crystal clear to you that were like, I just need to achieve that picture? Yeah. So I was always, it wasn't as much as I said, I was obsessed with so many Olympics. It wasn't me standing on the Olympic podium necessarily. I was really goal oriented and I always had a goal time. So whether it was 10 and under, I want to go a 30 seconds in my 50 fly or whatever it was. And that was, I used to write it down on my, like Kendall Stewart, Mrs. Lyman's class, third grade with like my goal. Like I was that I was obsessive with and I would visualize, um, I would like lay in my bed and like visualize my perfect swimming race and my perfect start, my perfect turn and all these things. Um, and then as I got older, I, I was like, I'm going to swim a 56 in the hunter fly in my life. Like that, yes, that was a time that would have made the Olympic team likely, but I was more obsessed with like pursuit of my own perfection of that skill. Um, and also really motivated by the experience things. Like I like to see my friends at practice and I like to goof off and just have fun in the water. And I think that when the alarm goes off and I'm thinking about, oh, I can't wait to get to the pool. It's like, I want to swim this time and I want to get in there and I want to practice the things that are going to help me get better at that. I want to put the reps in and it's going to be fun. Like I'm going to see my people there. And this is like the most connection and belonging that I've ever felt anywhere. So like I need to be there. Yeah. That's awesome. And such like a, I mean, that seems like something that just came so naturally to you around like having the goals and visualizing all of that. And like, love hearing the different stories from athletes around like what they were thinking about or what motivated them, because that's like such a tangible lesson or example of like what it takes to just be successful in life. Right. Like what a gift that like either you had, but like maybe you had it, but it was reinforced at least by swimming. Yeah, I think it was the 11, 12, just on the visualization visualization and the like goal writing thing. I think it was the 11, 12 national age group record. I could be wrong, but, or maybe it's a, I don't know, some sort of high school level swimming age group, something. And I wrote the goal time. I had it, I pulled it up. Okay, this is the record for my age group. And I wrote it down everywhere. It was 53.44 for this short course yard, hunter butterfly, I remember that. And I wrote it everywhere. And I didn't write a time that was faster than it. I wrote a time that was exactly the record. I'm going to swim this time. And when it must have been in high school, when CIF came around, I tied the time exactly. So it was me and this girl whose record I was trying to break, she like shared this record for years because I was obsessed with swimming at 53.44. And I just preached it. Like It sounds insane now, but it was everywhere. It like obsessed my life, covered my life. And I tied the time exactly. And from that, I was like sold. I was like, this is really powerful. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Isn't that weird? How, how did you, how would you deal then with meets where you didn't make that time? Like failure is such a part of life. It's such a part of sport and it's such a part of sales, obviously. So like there were probably meets where you didn't hit, you know, the number or whatever you were visualizing. Like, how do you feel like mentally you navigated that so, so yeah. well and so often? I think to put it in perspective, I think there were stretches of time in my swimming career where I didn't go best time. So my thing was a hunter fly and I swam, I was fastest in the country for my age group until I was probably, I don't know, until I went to college, let's say. And then I maybe, I don't know, I went like 59 seconds in the hunter fly forever. I went that time when I was 14. It was insane when I was 14. And then it was just like good until probably I was a sophomore in high school or in college. Like I just stuck at the same time forever. And then I chunked a huge chunk off and I was like, okay, I'm the best in the country now. And then I kind of stayed at that time for like another five or six years. And like, there's these plateaus that I think are career destroying for people. You're not improving. You're not seeing any difference on the scoreboard, but I leaned into this, like, okay, well, I'm getting stronger or like, I know that my starts, I'm always the last one off the blocks. 
and chunking it into these like process oriented goals and also having gratitude for like just the experience like I kind of mentioned before. I'm on scholarship at this awesome university and I'm a team captain of this team that is doing things that we haven't done in 30 years and I I'm traveling the world. I'm going to Machu Picchu. I'm going to like these insane destinations all over the world. I'm meeting people from these like swimming federations all over the world. Just the unique experiences for me is like, this is something that my peers who aren't in swimming just don't have access to. And I'm going to reap this reward as long as I can. And this is just swimming fast and, and posting best times. It's like, yeah, that's the goal, but there's so much in the process as well. So whether it's process oriented and like, having gratitude for what's presented on the day to day, whether it's like just health or travel or just friendship or whatever, or it's like process oriented tactic wise, like I'm going to do this drill to improve my turn 30 times. That's kind of fun because you can see tangible. That's a mini win. Um, I used to always, even if it was like the worst time of my life, I would watch race footage and be like, okay, well, what went well? Like on the worst race of my life, what am I doing well still? Like what is second nature? And then a bad swim is also an opportunity to learn and do it better next time. So there's like ways to kind of train yourself to be like, all right, that wasn't it. That's not the preferred situation, but everything is a learning opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, I mean, one, I know that like, as you progress in sports, like the, the smallest little variations become even harder and harder to get. Right. So like I pitched in college, throwing a baseball 90 miles per hour, very hard thing to do. But the difference between 90 and 92, once you're at that level, seems like a small gap, but it's a massive gap. Same thing for swimming, right? Like you're at yeah. whatever the number is, 59, getting down to 56 or 50, it's like whatever, but it's so, and it's it's exponential in swimming or racing because it's, you know, fractions of a second. So I think it's just a tough thing to do, like when you hit those plateaus and it's like, how do I break this down to be able to just get very incrementally better every single day. Um, that's a, that's a process in itself. That's like, is, is valuable to learn that lesson, but also to like run that process is a great thing to do. But I think what's even more like impressive is to have the gratitude mindset in college. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of athletes in college are just running the race you know, it's just practice, it's get better, it's the next game, it's the next thing. But to be able to take a step back and be like, well, I didn't win the race, but I'm healthy. I have the opportunity to get better tomorrow. I'm on this team, I'm having these great experiences. And to just be like aware of the experience that you're that you're going through is a is amazing thing to be able to do that in the in the face of it, like as it's happening, right? Typically that reflection comes after. Where do you think, was that, did that come natural to you or was that something that the coaches were preaching? Like, where did that come from? Um, It probably doesn't hurt. I mean, USC was a cool place to be. It doesn't hurt that like I was an athlete at an awesome university with a lot of resources, right? Like we had great coaches, we had, like awesome training environments it was just like a fun place to be in southern california swimming outside like it's hard to spin it in a negative way right yeah. um but yeah, i think that um our coaches also had like kind of a unique perspective on training it was a really it was a different type of training that i had done in everything is related back to swimming i guess <laughs> like in high school um there was this volume based, just like swimming nonstop kind of thing, which is appropriate, I guess, for the type of races that I was swimming then. But I came to college and I was specializing towards power races and sprint events. And we were playing games and we were doing fun relays and I was moving heavy stuff. And I was just kind of becoming more professional and taking more ownership of my own swimming rather than just like receiving orders as a young athlete. And I think my, my swim coach, Dave Salo was like pretty renowned in swimming for being like really creative. And so I think that the change of pace and the actual swimming that I was doing on the day-to-day -day was genuinely more fun. And I think just novelty in a different environment. And also, um, I think the gratitude thing is what you asked about. I think um, it was just like, it, it's really hard not to be grateful for the opportunity I was given. I think it was just a good place to be. I think anyone who um, has the opportunity to be like an NC2A Division One athlete, any sort of athlete, it's like, 
no nope, not, not everyone <laughs> gets that you know it's like how could you be how could you be pissed like yeah it's on the day-to-day -day grind maybe you're tired because you squatted heavy that day or you're like so many extra sprints but that's fun that's why you're doing it yeah if you're not having fun then you got other things you could be doing with your time right that's that's the thing about swimming it's like it's so much time and it's repetitive and if you don't like it people don't people i think either like enjoy some of the meditative aspects or like really get into it or think it's the most horrible boring thing of all time and it's like not worth the investment if you're not having fun it's too much of your time yeah well <laughs> any division one sport or any college sport or even some, you know, high school sports, depending on how serious you're taking it or how hard you're going at it. Like, honestly, I don't know if I would have played college baseball if there wasn't a, a chance to play beyond college and to achieve the dream that I had, like people that are going to school and, or are thinking about going to college for a sport where there's really nothing after it. You got to really love that sport, like a lot, you know, like I, I think people underestimate the time that any athlete goes through because it is, it is full time, all consuming. And it's not only just like when you're at practice, it's what are you eating? When are you sleeping? How are you sleeping? Who are you interacting with? Like, how do you dress? How do you, how do you, what music deals to like, it's your whole identity, right? So it's, it's got to be yeah. something that that you love and if it's that needs to be the minimum and if it's not if that's not there then you got no chance you're dead i struggled with that like full-time aspect when i graduated when i graduated college and i said okay i'm pretty close to making the olympic team i'm going to swim full-time i'm not going to just go and get a job after graduation i'm going to swim this is going to be my thing i'm going i'm making some money on the the national team i have some sponsors this isn't like by any means a lucrative sport to be professional in but unless with some exceptions unless you're like katie ledecky not to call her out but like if you if you are a multi-time olympic gold medalist the opportunity is there it's sort of like a rich, rich get richer scenario and if you're up and coming it is difficult um or there are challenges to it and i said i'm going to do this i really love swimming i'm going to stick with it but i struggled with that full-time aspect of it i felt like I know that there is a clock on my swimming career and I know that at some point I'm going to come where I need to get a job and like go to the quote, quote unquote, real world. But I couldn't just, whether it was getting an internship or doing informational interviews or just working on my website on the side or whatever it was, anything that was an investment in professional Kendall that comes after swimming felt like it was energy taken away from the thing I'm pursuing in the moment, which is swimming. And I just felt like, I generally am an all or nothing person by nature, but I, I didn't see that the, now I can see that there's benefit in having like a well-rounded life. And maybe that's why I had success in college is because I was so busy. I was a full-time student athlete. I had so many things going on. There was balance in my life when I wasn't swimming. Well, at least I had homework to do to distract me or, you know, maybe that was part of the picture that helps with athletic success. And, but afterwards I really struggled with that. Like I know, in, in my mind that I need to figure this out at some point, but I feel like I have to pause it and I can't even go there until I make the decision that now is the time. And I don't know if there's any way around that. And I, I don't know if I would have peace of mind that I gave everything to swimming that I did if I was kind of pursuing whatever professional progress alongside, um, or maybe some people are able to, to micro or to um, multitask is what I'm trying to say um better than I did but that was something that I was like god I don't know I don't know if the better thing is to be all in and then all in on the next thing or to try to kind of do both at the same time I was like I always just didn't really know what I was if I was doing it the right way yeah well I think it comes down to like regret right like do you, is there a chance that you're gonna wake up one day whether it's today or whether it's in the future and regret not not achieving your goals, but not achieving your goals because you didn't do everything in your power. That's a hard thing to live with. So I've heard quotes like, I don't have a plan B because it distracts from plan A. And I think that there's like, I don't know, I think there's value in that. I think like even when we're talking with athletes or like talking at a university, sometimes university is like, oh, I can put you in front of our freshmen or sophomores. And I'm like, no. They don't want to hear anything about what it takes, what it like life is like after sports. And nor should they even, in my opinion, even really be thinking about it all that much. 
Because if you're going to try to make the Olympics and be the best in the world at something, you shouldn't be thinking about plan B. Uh, so I, from my perspective, I think you, I think you did what you needed to do in order to try to have a realistic chance of achieving things that people say are unrealistic. Yeah, totally. I uh, appreciate that. But how did, so, okay. So let's transition now to like, you do have a decision to make, right? You have a life that's wrapped up in this identity. And I know that you've did a good job or like had a, maybe a, a different timing than most where you were kind of getting to a point where you were at peace around like, Hey, there's other things to life than this. Perhaps ha talk to, talk to me about the decision to like ultimately retire and, and how that felt because yeah, I was just reading something or listening to something and Tom Brady and some of these people are considering retirement and Tom Brady just said, retirement equals death. <laughs> it's obviously a pretty gnarly thing to say, but you're talking. Yeah, wow. First, my first reaction was like, oh my God, that is just like so intense, but honestly a little true. I think, okay. So um, I, it took me a little while. I'm generally like in all decisions in my life, whether it's deciding where I want to go to school or kind of coming to terms with the breakup. I see everything from every angle before I execute on it. And I sat on this decision for years, probably. I mean, this is the longest lasting relationship in my life. The most important thing that's kind of like steered every major decision in my life. It took me a while to realize like, okay, I'm feeling different about this than I have in a little while. Um, I think the pandemic kind of put it in an interesting pressure cooker, but um, I ultimately decided like, I'm, I'm critical, I'm hard on myself. And I think that any swimming success that I had on the way up, whether it was, you know, break a world record, silver medal at the world championships, like full ride college scholarship, like all these things that I could have been so proud of on the way up. It, I was so critical of like, but it's not the Olympics or like, but it's not a world record or like, but it's not a 56. I was just so like, okay. And on to the next, like, what is the next thing? Like cool, but not that cool. Like mm -hmm. so comparative and so self-critical, which is part of being great, but also exhausting. And I think I chose to see it as a way to, celebrate all of these other previous successes that I didn't really give attention to or like celebrate in the in the way that I should have and say hey the Olympics is just simply one other swim meet I've been to every single other one medaled at every single other one I've represented my country for 10 years I when I was 10 years old like would look at Splash magazine and like look at all these women and I have been in that magazine like I am so proud of the things that I've done and I just like stop hanging my hat on this one little swim meet that is maybe not going to happen or not. And I just chose to kind of lean away from that and celebrate opting out of this one thing. Not to say that I was a shoe in to make the team, but opting out of trials at least, or kind of deciding that I didn't even want to go for it felt like a celebration of all these other things that I had really been critical of and could have been celebrating, but it was like a shocking realization. I remember I was like, I, I told my parents, I was like, I don't think I care about the Olympics anymore and just sobbed for like days and was so I remember this feeling of like I wish that someone would just whisper in my ear and tell me like this is what you need to do next like this is what's going to make you happy like this is the path out just because like it, it is a death of identity it's like it's so dramatic and maybe unrelatable to no one who's ever transitioned out of sport but it's like my social life my education all my travel like my fam not my family dynamic but it's like my family travels to my swim meets and it's how I spend my free time and it's like what my car smells like chlorine it's like everywhere you know it's like yeah, um, it's yeah and it just infects kind of more things than you realize it's like okay I'm not going to be spending 30 hours a week exercising I'm going to move on to the next thing but it's taken like it was really slow at first and I talked to you probably pretty early on and I was just like I don't even know where to start um and it took a series of informational interviews of just like trying things I had no idea like I don't even think this sounds good I don't even think that sounds good but I'm just going to try something just to, to learn quickly what I like and what I don't like um whether it's professionally whether it's like I took tennis lessons once a week just to get myself out of the house because I was like I am I'm not going to practice but I'm going crazy because I'm not moving like I just need to get out and do different things. It was like being a child, like trying different sports again. Like your parents enter you into all these little things. You do all these extracurriculars. 
you see what subjects in school you're good at it's like truly just you have to be <laughs> like willing to suck your ego back inside you and just like do all these different things and it's been um humbling definitely well I think it will I think it's a process right like anything it's like grieving even in a sense right like you're going through kind of this emotional like roller coaster that has different phases I don't know if and when it ever like you're at complete peace with it it's just a matter of again like probably there's an element of doing everything you can to like reflect and be proud and not have regret. And that's one aspect of it. But then the other aspect is just figuring out like, you know, your parents, your friends, social media, whatever it is like Kendall Stewart, the swimmer. And if it's not Kendall Stewart, the swimmer, then what is it? And do you need even a Kendall Stewart, the something else, or can you be Kendall Stewart, you know? So that whole that whole like wrapping your mind around all of that is a it's a very challenging thing and obviously you're not alone in that but it doesn't make it any easier I also find myself like talking about it I mean I talk about swimming a a lot I mean I retired maybe two years ago and I expect to be on this transition for another couple years many more years maybe my whole life like I I definitely think I'm in a different place than I was fresh when I decided, but I find myself like, oh, one time with this person or like, oh, at USC when we did this, remember at this travel meet this, or like every experience I have that I relate back to swimming and I'm ta- in conversation with someone who wasn't there or doesn't care or just doesn't know. I like have the shame of like, oh my God, no one cares. It's you're out of that bubble. And it's like, ooh, like you're not Kendall the swimmer anymore to this person. And it's hard to A, be like patient and be like, duh duh this is what how you're acting like this is my only life experience but also like get out of that like just accrue enough experience outside of that little bubble that I you know move on from like Kendall the swimmer it's it's interesting to kind of reflect and like you said yeah it's like okay I am Kendall the swimmer I'll always be a swimmer or swimmer or that will always be an important part of my identity but it's like I don't actively swim anymore and that's a a funny thing or people ask questions about it and I'm proud of it and I don't and I'm content with my decision to move on from it but it's it's a fascinating thing to like meet new people and explain it and also like reminisce with people who have known it's just yeah an interesting yeah an interesting coming to terms yeah 100 percent, and it's like you, you used to be able to walk into a room and not even have to explain it you know it was probably yeah. already done for you or somehow they saw the clothes you were wearing or someone introduced you and it's like people want to just put a label on you um and when you don't have that I remember just like I got to figure out what my next thing is it's just the it's a it's a very very challenging thing to navigate probably a deeper psychology conversation that we can have about, around it I appreciate you sharing that and like being real about it because the goal of, of some of this is for other athletes to hear it and be like, okay, at the minimum, I'm not alone. Maybe there's ways to connect everyone just because I don't think a lot of people are really talking about it. Like you'll get that soundbite on ESPN about Tom Brady and it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. This is like his thing, but it's like, you can be Tom Brady and that's obvious. You can also be Kendall Stewart. You could be Ryan Feffley, or you could be the guy that like, re- it was very real to him or her to be in the Olympics or to be, on a college team and it didn't happen but that's still like how they view themselves and it's a hard thing no matter who you are if you've ever identified as an athlete and it's ever been your thing like for real your thing it's hard to just kind of like act like that never happened yeah absolutely absolutely I think when Simone Biles at the Olympics like didn't she got the twisties or whatever and didn't not or whatever she got the twisties and didn't compete and came out and was like I'm just not well and I'm I don't want to do this and it's not important my mental health is more is the priority I just was like thank you (laughs) that is exactly how I feel that was truly how I felt like this is just another competition I am unwell I'm just just put myself in this place where I'm not having fun and I'm so self-critical and it's hard and dark and scary and I don't like swimming anymore but and I almost it's like you get into this place well 
maybe it's not as big of a deal or people don't care as much or it'll be harder to explain because I'm not Simone Biles, you know, but I think having these conversations kind of alleviates that. It's like, of course, it's the hours and identity and time spent and goals chased, it's like, it doesn't, the scale on which you do it. People are always like, oh, my, my friend swam, but not at your level. Or like, I know about swimming, but not like you. It's like, it's the same thing. It's truly the same thing. And so I think that it's important to talk about it. Yeah. Um, weird question, but I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you feel watching the Olympics now? Or can you watch them? Um, in 2016, I didn't watch, um, at all, which is funny. Cause I just got done saying like, that was fine. <laughs> um, I didn't watch, but this time around I did. And I enjoyed it. Actually, I have enough friends that are in the Olympics that I was eager to be there and not there but watching and supporting and I felt like by my fourth Olympic cycle I was invested like I know these people I've grown up with these people this is something that's important to me that um I've raced these people you know it's like this is my world and I um felt like an interesting sense of peace just kind of like spectating which actually was pretty liberating I was like I'm glad that I feel well rested watching this rather than um having like my identity tied to it right now um which I think is maybe the distinction from 2016 where I was like I was almost there and it's a disappointment that I'm not in some sense even though I think I handled it better than um some do um I think that having just like realized that it was time and having honest with that I was like generally okay with it any but I'm not sorry go ahead any relief yeah, I think actually that sense of relief was was strong for me after the Olympic trials, which it's truly, it's like a, it's a toxic swimming. Like you could be the best swimmer in the world and the country for 10 years running and they select the Olympic team, which is the only swimming event that people outside of the sports swimming care about, right? It's the the event to get viewership to get sponsorships to have like the olympic glory they pick that team off of a one swimming you swim in the morning if you don't make top 16 you're out even if you've been the best swimmer for four years you swim in the evening if you don't make top eight you're out if you don't make there's top no like two, exceptions you're out. or like subjectivity Nothing. if you it? have food poisoning if you have food poisoning that day you are fucked like you just can't swim in the olympics even if you hold the world record wow and it is a pressure cook it is just like that's why people say just especially if you make the United States Olympic swimming team you are not guaranteed because that's a cocky sort of like way to present but USA swimming is a pretty dominant force in Olympic sport and if you're on the team you have a great shot at winning medal and it's this insane meet where we all come to and I was just like I don't want to be there and the result of that meet I mentioned previously like all these up and coming youngsters who were kind of on that like fast track that I explained I was on earlier really just booted all of the like national team vets out kind of and it was a blind side because there wasn't all two years of competition leading up to kind of look around and judge who's swimming well and who wasn't it was just this like weird vibe from what I heard just all my friends were like it was a bad time and I was just like so happy to have been removed from that and been like okay I'm sorry that that was your experience and like the whole world is feeling some sort of pain in this pandemic and everyone is like having different experiences but I was just glad that I was like already on my path to finding the next thing rather than just having it hit me and having it feel like a side swipe rather than just choosing it for myself yeah being able to choose your own way out is like it's always better I mean there's there's maybe one two whatever it is people where it's like they get through that and then they go to the Olympics, they win the gold medal, right? And in each event, it's one. So it's like, everyone's going to be disappointed. And like the mental strain that you go through to get to that point, it's like, it is very common to hear in my conversations with athletes that have retired, there's moments of a breakdown, sadness, all of that. But there's an instant, like, I don't need to worry about that anymore. And that, yeah. that I've, seems slept, I've slept so much, like in the immediate following but also I think like in the past couple of years I think I've been in this like the decision of swimming being done with swimming itself was like 
a weight off. But then I also put myself in all these new scenarios. I moved to a new city. I got a new job. Like I had a breakup. Just my, the, it wasn't just swimming. It was like all these other things kind of fell too. And all the fight or flight kind of feeling of putting myself in all of these new scenarios for the first time, truly since I was seven years old, I'm a beginner at my job, which is so humbling and living in a new city for the first time ever, because I'm not like where the swim teams are, like all of it is new. And I think now just two years after all of this has kind of blown up, the fight or flight element is wearing off and I'm adjusting to my new life. And now I feel tired again. I'm like, okay, I made it through this like wave one of intense life change. And now I'm beginning to get into my rhythm and my routine and be like, okay, this is my life now, which is another kind of like exhausting realization. It's like an interesting ebb and flow of like just navigating change. I think it's going to be a cycle. Yeah. There's all these different seasons that you'll kind of come in and out of them um, as time progresses. But what is, um, let's talk about finding your current job and, and kind of how that transition's been. So you're in a BDR role now in the tech world, you found yourself kind of like probably some similarities, at least in terms of like the, what it takes to be successful and probably pulling from your athletic experience. Talk about your transition into sales and kind of how that has been and what the similarities that you see are. Um, and maybe a follow-up question to that, if you want to touch on is like, what do you wish you knew when you retired and found software sales? Like what would have been helpful? Yeah. yeah. So when I first retired, I actually didn't go right into tech sales. I had talked to you and was kind of like, I don't really even know what, I don't even have any work experience. I don't even know what these softwares are. Like, why is that supposed to be interesting to me? And you're like, okay, <laughs> like I think you'll be good at it, but do whatever is calling you. So I first did worked at a swimming startup and I was like, I'll have immediate impact on the market. And like, I know the product so well, I can have tangible value. And this would be like my soft launch into the workforce. I know like swimming well, and I liked it. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity, but I don't feel like my brain was well suited for the position I was in. It was like a marketing role that I liked the creative, the creative aspects, but I had hands on a lot of different projects and it was a really small org. And I didn't have a sense of like, when my promotion was coming or even what I needed to do to climb my little ladder. It was like, I didn't have a goal time to write down next to my name and like <laughs> my starts and turns to practice. I was just kind of like moving through day to day, kind of like, all right, what should I do now? Which I did not like the feeling of. Um, and everyone has always told me, not everyone, but a lot of athletes are so well suited to sales. It's, it's performance, you know, it's structure. It's all these things that like you're, you're just, that's the way you're wired, clearly. I'm like, all right, all right. Um, and it's been great. And everyone was right. <laughs> and um, maybe that is just like the way I am to someone tells me to do one thing. I'm like, I'm going to try something else first. But um, I do think that it's similar in a lot of ways. The having a quota, chasing that concrete number. I think that is definitely that someone who is goal oriented and used to kind of chasing something as well suited for I think that in my brain, I was like, okay, swimming is reps. That's what being a BDR is, just reps, right? It's a numbers game. Swimming is reps. It's back and forth. It's chasing a time. Like, it's the same. You're going to be great at it. And so I kind of was like, not this is going to be a walk in the park. Here I go. It's going to be the same. So I'm going to be good at it. But like, kind of. And it's very humbling to be a beginner at something. I have like a little bit of a sense of arrested development. Like <laughs> these kids are younger than you and it's not that hard on the day to day, but anything that's new is like, there's a learning curve to it. And I think immediately I was like, okay, well, I am a world champion swimmer and I'm just going to like send, make these cold calls. It's everyone says I'm going to be good at it. So I'm going to be good at it. And I think that I was like a little unprepared for that feeling of like, yes, you're going to be well suited for it, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be the best at it on day one. Um, is I think something that I have learned am learning to be a little more comfy in is like, it's okay. You're trying something new for the first time since you were seven and you are good at it. And, um, there's that. I think that, um, it's really similar to operating on like a sports team. Even we were just talking before we started recording about like being in person in an office and having that be kind of like 
important in a BDR org because it's that team feeling. And I think that um, everyone's kind of doing the same thing on the day to day and working towards a, a hard goal, especially in a time now, like just being in a tough economy. It's like, we've got a mountain to climb and this group is going to do it together. And it's strikingly similar to being on like a, a sports team. If you had, you, you know, there's like a, a team culture to kind of be mindful of and what's the chit chat in the locker room and like, are the vibes high? It's like kind of similar in that way too, which is not something that I really expected. The group is much more eclectic, right? You have like all these different types of people who aren't from this athletic background. And, um, but if there is some sort of like, real importance in leadership and having someone that you can trust to kind of like follow and train you. And um, I do think that, I do think that people were right who told me that athletes are well suited for cycles. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like, it's interesting to hear you say that because like everyone said you were going to be good at it. You are good at it. You'll continue to be good and great at it. But they were saying the same thing to you when you were eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, like you're going to be good or great at this, but that doesn't mean that it's like destined, like you still need to go out and work for it. And I think what a lot of athletes, like some it's eye opening and some, maybe it's refreshing, but it's like, it's always this balance of being super hungry and ambitious, but you kind of get like a dose of humility in the process too, which I think is, is sports too. Like you're, you can't just show up. Like there are times where you could be the most prepared and feel like, or or even know for a fact that you're better individually or your team's better and you lose. And there's definitely still more growth needed, more learnings needed. And you need to be able to balance that hunger with the humility to be coachable and to be open to trying new things and being pushed out of your comfort zone. Like all of those things that you can pull from, from your athletic career that, um, athletes that are especially just like new to it and getting started I think it's like okay here's like a new challenge and I'm I'm back in at least an arena a, a feeling that I'm getting that feels familiar at least totally I think one thing that you just reminded me of is in my first couple of weeks couple of months having new to a quota and being like <laughs> I just set three meetings in one day I am the best I am just like sales queen I am just <laughs> on a roll and then just not setting a meeting for two weeks and being like they're gonna fire me I'm never gonna set another meeting again like I'm not cut out for this and being like this is the hardest thing I've ever done and just being like I have felt this way before yeah. I like let's remove my identity from setting these silly little meetings for this silly little software <laughs> yeah. um and just remember that feeling of like walking out of practice and being like I just have never swam so fast in my life I was at world record pace like I this is easy this is easy and then, and then just not being able to even do the bare minimum like it's it, that is familiar and I was like okay once I just take a step back I'm like I've done this my whole life let's just take a second ride the roller coaster down and it just like control you here but that was something right off the bat I was like this is a familiar feeling here hmm. and this is a little bit of a roller coaster that I've been on before yeah, well, you can you can have those days or weeks or quarters where it's like, yeah, I'm the man. And then others, like you said, where it's just super low. And it's like, maybe maybe the secret's going to get out on me and everyone's going to know that I actually suck at this. Um, yeah. but I think, you know, the good the good ones, just like athletes, are the ones that can remain, you know, fairly neutral through all that and not ride those highs and lows as much because everything is going to pass. And it's really just about like, how do you stay consistent throughout all of that? And the other thing that's like tied into that, which is interesting is, and I'm, I don't, I haven't talked about this much is like wrapping up your identity in being the best seller in the world and like falling back into that, like ball game where it's like, that's not, that's not the answer either. Right. Like if you're wrapping up your identity and self-worth and your ability to like hit your number, it's like, here's a like, no one cares. <laughs> it's like, no one cares. So yeah. you have, you can take, I think what you can pull from all of it. And which is like, probably maybe the longest last lasting life lesson is like the gratitude, like in the highs and the lows, like you have so much positive in your life and you have the opportunity to make money and 
have some financial freedom and options to have great experiences like with your family and like your friends and like loved ones. Like, I think that's one of the things that software sales, it gets lost in the conversation of, hey, your mindset as an athlete is so like seamlessly tied to the mindset of a high performing sales professional. But what it allows you to do is all those things that you had with with athletics, which is I get to go have experiences. I get to practice gratitude. I get to be grateful. I get to do things beyond this that aren't just tied to playing the sport or selling the software. Because at the end of the day, who cares about selling the software? It's about like the other things that it allows you to do and what it allows you to like potentially give back and do other things in life that maybe are more meaningful. So that's something that I think comes with a little bit of time in the seat as well. Totally. I think um, something that I was, I was actually talking to my dad about, um, he is also in sales, but we were something that one of my swimming mentors has said for my, my whole swimming career, he was like a national youth team coach. And then he ended up, you know, coaching one of my professional teams. He's been there through it all. His favorite thing is the only thing you can control is your effort and your attitude. And then swimming to me, that's like, you can't, control whether this girl swims faster than you or not or if she also breaks the world record you know when you do um but you or you you know even if you have a bad swim you can take it as a learning experience whatever but also I think about that a lot in sales too it's like I can control my whether it's my output how many calls and emails I'm making or um my attitude like okay you can raise quota you can lay off some of the team you can there's just so many things that are not in my direct control but I think that just like coming back to those two things, whether your attitude is gratitude or just, um, you know, being hungry for self-development and like, that's what I like is just kind of chasing and honing a skill. Um, Just kind of focusing on like doing your job and doing it well and being a leader by example. I think those are things that have been important to me in in both my careers. Yeah, I think that there's always going to be things that you can't control, maybe more so in this than in athletics even, right? Like going into a bad economy, there's all these things that can go wrong in any given deal. And um, the ones that can control, like you said, their effort and their attitude are the ones that are gonna get more enjoyment day to day and like have more ownership and control of like their own happiness, I think, and not be so um vulnerable to things that are out of their control but also the ones that are probably gonna you know withstand like the longevity that it takes to see things kind of come to fruition in sales because nothing happens overnight and are gonna have a a career that they can be proud of or again that they can use as a springboard to transition into something that maybe they're more passionate about or maybe that's something that is more fulfilling because i always say at the end of the day it's like no one's super fired up to sell software, but it allows you the ability to like align to who you are and stimulates you in some way. And then something that you can, you know, again, use as a springboard. I think um, that's where like, it really shows its value. Totally. All right. Well, you've had quite the journey and you're, wildly successful you'll continue to be wild success wildly successful you have a super bright future and i'm very very grateful for the friendship that i feel like we've created and for you coming on today and i look forward to uh to doing this again yes absolutely thanks so much for having me i love talking about talking about this i imagine that it'll be something that's important to me for a long time to come whether it's talking to like younger athletes or just people of similar experiences so i loved it happy to chat any and all the time. Awesome. And if anyone wanted to reach out to you directly, I'd imagine they could find you on LinkedIn, Instagram, anything that they can reach yes. out to directly. Yes. Um, my Instagram is K underscore underscore Stewie, S T E W Y, LinkedIn, Kendall Stewart. Um, yeah, whatever works. <laughs> I'm not hard to find on the internet. Sometimes I'm a little <laughs> sad about that, but <laughs> all right. Well, Good catching up. And uh, again, thank you so much. And we'll do it again soon. Amazing. Thanks. Bye.